the White Ship. She was one of the fastest vessels that was ever built. The man who should be king of the English now, the son of King Henry, was on board when she sailed off. And with the prince there were 140 knights and many nobles, all on their way from Normandy to England. They say the ship hit the rocks, and then a fire broke out. Even before the white ship had departed, the prince and his men had begun to drink and get violent. Monks that were meant to bless the voyage were then forced to disembark. Some say the ship had been cursed. The king's son and many of his family were pulled down into the Black Sea that night. You're forgetting one important detail. Not only these monks, but also Stephen of Blois, the king's nephew, left the ship before it embarked. They say he got ill. That old rumor. The same Stephen who calls himself the King of the English now. What? That cannot be a coincidence. Yes, it can be. Of course he's king now. He survived. He is the king's nephew. What do you think, my lord? I think Stephen is a clever man. Clever enough to have his whole family perish. But why he would want to rule that godforsaken rock, I will never understand. What makes you say that? I love my country. Then why are you leaving? Well, because I want to see something new. I'll tell you what you're going to see. A proper country, where people know how to behave. What about you? Why are you leaving? I'm looking for someone. For who? Uh, I, I guess I should stay out of other people's business. Forgive me. You English do talk a lot, don't you? I just don't know how to feel about leaving my country for the first time. I mean, how should anyone feel? You'll see what happens. I don't know. Maybe I'm just running away. You should all get some rest. It will not be long now till we reach Sherbourg. Thank the Lord. I can't wait to be back. In the late summer of 1142, I had left my home country, England, for good. My old life lay in shambles, as did my former home of Kingsbridge. Having failed both my friends and family, 
I had set out to find my baby's father, the man I still loved with all my heart, Jack Jackson. And so early one morning in July, I finally arrived on the shores of Normandy. With nothing on me but a pouch of coin and a young, curious face yet unnamed, who was just as unfamiliar to this new world as was I. Your father uses tools like this, too. I should keep my dagger hidden. You're still here. Oh, it's you. I'm just trying to get my feet used to good solid ground again. The last bit of our voyage wasn't exactly my pint of ale. I'm looking for someone, a red-haired mason called Jack Jackson. He came to France about a year ago or so. A fellow mason, great. Unfortunately, I wouldn't know a thing. After all, I just arrived here with you. I know, but should you meet someone like that on your journey? Tell him Aliena of Shiring is looking for him. All right. Jack Jackson. I'll keep an eye out for you. Thank you. Have a safe journey. Oh, thank you. You too. Good day. I am looking for someone, a traveller who came through here last summer. Oh, hush now. I, I need to talk to this man. Looks young. He was born at the beginning of summer. What's his name? I haven't given him one yet. You should. He needs to know who he is. Makes growing up a lot easier. You said you're looking for someone. I'm looking for the boy's father. Well, from the look of your baby, I reckon his father has red hair like me, right? Well, I don't know every redhead around these parts. There are quite a few of us. Most of my family here in Cherbourg is ginger. Oh, his name is Jack Jackson, and he is a mason. Hmm. No. No, sorry. I haven't seen him. And I come here every day. And maybe a May saw him. She helps the sailors get their cargo to the nearby towns. Carries travellers, too. I'll ask her. Well, thank you. Where did you go, Jack? Where did you go, Jack? Have you seen a red-haired mason? You must have landed here sometime late last summer. <laughs> Another ginger in Normandy? I wouldn't have noticed, even if he was carrying a hammer instead of a fishing rod. Maybe you should ask someone in Barfleur. That's where all the travellers come through, the pilgrims and kings. Their lot rarely lands in Cherbourg, with the fortress passing back and forth between Stephen of Blois and Geoffrey of Anjou. Why you even came to Cherbourg in the first place baffles me. It was the earliest ship I could get. You must be in some hurry, madam. Let's just say I needed to get away before I changed my mind. Fine with me. Who am I to judge? All right. Take me out of town. All right. Where do you need to be? We went to Barfla, a scenic port town built on granite. It was the biggest harbour in Normandy and the main entry point for the Normans to their new possession of the Isle of England. I talked to some of the sailors and fishermen, but no one had remembered seeing Jack. How could they? Almost a year had passed since he, a simple mason, had journeyed through the busy town, a town with no memory other than that of the last king who passed through on yet another one of his violent conquests. 
Maybe I was approaching this the wrong way. What had drawn him to France in the first place? The distance to Kingsbridge? Or something specific? What was my lead? Lisey was tiny, but as it turned out, worth the trip. In the small abbey church of the Trinity, I met a monk who claimed to have talked to a man fitting Jack's description. He'd been fascinated by the abbey's rib vaulting and had asked the monks countless questions about the place's construction. The monk apologized that he couldn't tell me where Jack had traveled next, but I didn't mind. I lay down to sleep on the floor of the abbey guest house and, for the first time in almost a year, I felt relief. As I drifted into sleep, I hugged our baby tight and whispered into his tiny pink ear, we're going to find your daddy. My father had once told me tales of the Mont Saint-Michel. Long ago, the Archangel Michael had urged Hubert of Avranches to build an abbey on a lonely rock on the ocean by burning a hole into his head. They say one can go and see his penetrated skull on display in the church of his hometown. It was a windy day when I arrived, and the place was crowded with pilgrims, pilgrims and jongleurs. I remember Jack's fascination with these tellers of stories. I spoke to one who was just taking a break. As it happened, he had indeed met Jack, although not in Mont Saint-Michel, but on a road heading east from there. Apparently, Jack had been hopelessly tracking Jongleur, who might have known his father, Jack Cherberg. But as he'd been gradually running out of money, he'd intended to look for work in Le Mans or Tours. That was about six months ago. I was catching up. I should talk to him first. Good day. Are you the master builder? What is it? I'm looking for a mason who may have passed through here. An Englishman with carroty hair. He calls himself Jack Jackson. Hmm. A redhead? Yes. Did you see him? He might have asked for work here. No, no. I I'm not looking for new masons. We're just doing repairs. Ah, but was he here? No, never seen him. Now, stand back, woman. Something could fall on your baby's head. Are there other construction sites around Tours? Well, yes. It's a big town. And where would an outsider most likely find a job? Dunno. Ask around. You hesitated when I mentioned a redhead. Are you sure you haven't seen him? Yes, I am sure. May I talk to your workers? No, they're busy. And I can assure you they have nothing to say on that matter. Perhaps I'll talk to them once they've finished for the day. 
It would be a waste of time. <sighs> all right, all right, he was here. Was working for me. But I had to throw him out after two or three days. Why? Because he was all want, want, want. Let me redesign the roof. Let me make the nave lighter. All pretty ideas, but he never shut up long enough to do the work he was supposed to do. Shit, that man was almost as needy as my son when he was still a brat. Mm, he does know a lot about his craft. Well, I know masons like him. They grow up gifted, but without a moat of discipline in their guts. Can't work with someone like that. Do you know where he went next? No idea. Maybe to Limoges or Angoulême. Maybe even to La Rochelle. Seemed to have plans for every cathedral on God's green earth, but none for himself. I understand. I'll leave you to it then. Bon voyage. We had just left Tor when I suddenly felt dizzy. I stopped and made rest, trying to catch my breath, then lost my breakfast in a ditch at the side of the road. To my horror, our baby too had grown pale, his breath shallow like that of an old man. I tried not to panic, but the next inn was a long distance away and we couldn't stay on the road where it was wet and cold. I managed to walk until the sun had fully risen before I keeled over. A knife merchant who'd been travelling behind me flagged down a coach heading back to Tor and haggled with the coachman to carry me back to an inn. Back in Tor, the fever got worse. I remember people carrying me into a room, laying me on a bed. I tried to feed my baby, but after that everything turned into a blur. When I awoke, Jack was standing next to my bed. He scolded me for following him. You know you could go anywhere you want, he whispered. Why be stupid and follow me? I tried to answer, but he just opened the window and jumped out, heading toward ancient Greece, or maybe all the way to Arabia. And in my feverish mind, I followed him. The further I went, the angrier I got. For years, I'd been fighting for my family. I'd committed myself to an oath to my father. I'd built up a business to sustain it and even married a man I despised so I could create a future for the people around me. I'd known nothing but my duty to the men in my life, while the man I was trying to find live a life of casual irresponsibility. He travelled the world on a whim to learn about mathematics and philosophy while I had to raise the child he'd fathered. When could I ever do anything just for myself? I asked the world as I went on. I'd travelled in a circle all the way to the edge of the world and back, only to return to the place of our failure. With my eyes closed, I listened to the sound of ripping yarn and crumbling walls, and of coaches carrying good people away into a cloud of crimson dust. When the last moat had settled, I opened my eyes again and found myself in a dirty little room. An old maid was sitting next to my bed and smiled at me, then handed me my baby. 
Oh, dear God. He still looked so pale. The more I tried to keep him warm, the colder he felt. Oh, please, God, let him live. Don't punish him for my own sins. I gently caressed his head until finally he put his mouth to my breast and drank and drank more and more, becoming greedier with every swallow. We had both been spared. We rested one more day. Then I gathered my things and headed back to the cathedral to thank the Lord for his mercy. Where did you go, Jack? Where did you go, Jack? This isn't a good place for praying. I thank you, dear Lord. All right, steady I thank now. Thank you for having spared my child. I thank you for. Don't let go until it's done. But why are you showing mercy on me? I failed everyone I cared about. I failed Jack. I failed my brother. And if I never return, I would also break the oath I had given father. It's just... It's just that I feel like I've never had a life of my own. I've always fought for others. And this may be the very first time that I fight for something that I only want for myself. Maybe I should just go back and help rebuild Kingsbridge. Maybe Jack doesn't even care for me anymore. Amen. Huh. I've seen one of those before. It's amazing, isn't it? The man who did that really had it in him. I agree. He always did. Oh, you knew Master Jacques? Yes, but it's been a while since I last saw him. It's a shame that the Master let him go. In just one month he did so many things. What did he do? He came up with ideas for how to make the construction easier. But the Master didn't want to hear it. To tell you the truth, Everyone thinks that he feared for his own job having someone like that around. The last thing Jack did was carve that corbel. It was the one thing the master let him do. Then when he was done, he was asked to leave. It bears so much pain. I know. Jack worked very hard on it. He was impatient and had a temper, but you could see that he tried to overcome it. Conquering that rock was very important to him. Oh, I understand that so well. Do you happen to know where he went next? He wanted to walk the pilgrim trail to Santiago de Compostela. The Camino? The way of St. James? He said he might find someone there who knew his father. Just one more thing. How was he when he left? Hmm. Never thought about that. Relieved, I guess. He seemed ready for something new. Thank you so much for your help. Think nothing of it. And good luck on your travels. May you find what you are looking for. Isn't it odd? Just when you stop looking, you come across the most curious of things. Like these three devices that one of my merchants brought back from Baghdad. <laughs> oh no, is it another one of your Banu Musa toys, Rashid? 
They're not toys, Adriel. They're objects of scholarly ingenuity and reflection. I will let my valued friend from the North do the honors. Jack, if you may. <laughs> For one, let me draw your attention to the magnificent songbird on the table. Um, on second thought, why don't you save the lady for last? Otherwise, the other two devices might appear bland and boring in comparison. I agree. And then, to that wondrous donkey well, next too to heavy. the entrance. Although... The most astounding thing of all stands right between them. That statuette? Ha <laughs> ha, precisely. But one thing at a time, let us let Jack decide what to demonstrate first. And now? Now, we need to add some water. He likes to take his time, doesn't he? It's so beautiful it will make you cry. Just listen. How does it work? Maybe it's a miracle. <laughs> right. Go on, Jack. Tell them. It is possessed by an evil spirit. <laughs> is this what you people tell each other in your church, Rashid? That modern machinery is created by the devil? Of course not. Jack is just teasing you. What happens is this. There is a water wheel hidden in the back, rotating an axis that in return moves a sequence of small cylinders. It lifts and drops these cylinders like fingers playing a flute. But who is blowing into the flute? Steam. Steam? Yes. When I opened the pipe, it gradually pushed itself into the tube. The power of steam. For once, I must agree, this is brilliant. Of course! It was created by a Muslim after all. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. What else have you got, Rashid? Anyone care for some tea? Thank you, my daughter. We will have some as soon as Jack has finished our presentation. Mind if I watch? Of course not. So, who is this man, Rashid? Jack is a friend of the Don't house. Don't let me distract you, Jack. A brilliant man, a scholar and a talented artist. Just the other day, he explained Euclid to me. What is that? A Greek who wrote a book called The Elements of Geometry. The Egyptians translated it into Arabic, and now the Englishmen are turning no, it into too heavy. Latin. How very peculiar. Hmm. 
No, it's too heavy. I could watch this man scoop up water all day. That's not how she works. Now, watch the head. Just any moment now. There. Did you see? It threw up. Gee, this is disgusting. Oh, far from it. Would you kindly explain how it works, Jack? It's pure magic. Is it? I've heard that these northerners believe in all kinds of things. That God has a son made of flesh and blood, for example. Mocking one's prophets can go in both directions, Adriel. I am very certain that my god can take your weak little jokes, Rashid. So, how does it work? Ah... That small floating bowl has a hole at the bottom gradually filling it with water. Once the bowl is full, it pulls on a string, making the ball drop from the mouth. The ball then hits a weight, pulling the bowl back up, thus resetting the entire mechanism. If you timed it perfectly, you could make it drop a ball at every hour. Turning it into a clock. How clever. For me, it's still nothing more than a puking donkey. <laughs> Show us more, Rashid. One could join those two and build a singing donkey clock. One song after every hour. That would be pretty clever. I know, right? You could be the one to build it. Oh, that would be unfair. It's your invention. I would let you have it. Or we design it together. <clears throat> you still haven't shown us that statuette yet. Of course. Jack, if you may. Oh, you will love this. Just watch. And now? Just be patient, but don't look away. It takes some time for her to... To do what? Hmm? Is it crying? Isn't that amazing? No, it's irritating. Rashid, what is going on? It's a mystery. Rashid, please. We all know that there is no such thing as a man-made miracle. And this piece of wood is very clearly made by man. I very much agree, my friends. But so far, none of us has an explanation. All we know for certain is that her glassy eyes shed tears when you move her from warmth into cold. Like a plant at sunrise. Like dew. The only difference is the surface, that's all. I think you may be onto something. Am I? Of course, I had no intention of disturbing your conversation. But if you can find out why there's dew gathering on a plant, you may understand why that woman is so weepy. So, who wants a cup of tea? 
I'll have some. Your daughter is quite something, Rashid. A scholar in her own right. I know. I'd rather she wasn't. It would make marrying her off so much easier. Oh, I'm certain that won't stay a problem for long. Maybe the dew originates from invisible water in the air. Water that stays hidden when it's hot. The pilgrim trails across France converged at Osterbat in the foothills of the Pyrenees. There, the group of 20 or so pilgrims who had been travelling alongside me since I'd left Tours swelled to about 70. Some were prosperous citizens, some probably on the run from justice, a few drunks and several monks and clergymen. Several languages were spoken, including Flemish, a German tongue, and a southern French language called Oc. Nevertheless, there was no lack of communication among them, and as we crossed the Pyrenees, they sang, played games, told stories, and in several cases, had love affairs. While my baby and I kept mostly to ourselves. Ganz schön frech, die mit ihrem Kind. Hush now. Hmm? I'm sorry. He has to cry himself out before he'll fall asleep. It will give you a strong voice one day, won't it? Do you have children? Richtig mm. dreist. How long have you been traveling to get here? I met pilgrims from as far east as Franconia. I am sorry. We'll go for a walk so you can get some rest. Kann ein Mann nicht einfach mal seine Ruhe haben? Der Weg aus Babenberg war doch anstrengend genug. Tomorrow. She's not listening. <laughs> Dear Lord, what are you doing? You should get out of the water. It's freezing. My ring. I lost my ring. Dear Lord, please show mercy. <laughs> I'm glad I never had to use my dagger on my journey. I'm come only keeping it for me. emergencies. Please come back to me. The cold will kill you. I can't leave without my ring. I'm glad I never had to use my... I'm only Where keeping it for emergencies. Where did you go? I'm glad I never had to use my dagger on my journey. I'm only keeping it for emergencies.
come back to me. Please come back to me. Where are you? Where did you go? I found it. Yes! Oh, thank you! Thank you so much! You are a very kind woman. So very, very kind. I'm glad I could help. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I can see this ring is very precious to you. It, it was a gift from my stepmother. She thought I would stay forever, but I didn't. Why did you leave? Oh, I... I... I thought I didn't belong. She always said I was her daughter, but I was sure she was lying. I was so selfish and so stupid. Too stupid to see I really was happy. Are you getting warmer? I am, thank you. Maybe you really weren't happy. I don't know. I was very young and thought I was unhappy because I didn't live close to the sea. But in the end, the sea did not feel the same about me. The cold there made me sick. It took away my sight. It was courageous of you to leave. You did what your heart told you to. I was stupid. So, so stupid. Ah, that's why you went on the pilgrimage. Yes, so that Sir James might see my devotion and I will be united with my mother in heaven. I'm just not as kind as you. Not kind at all. You're too hard on yourself. I don't know. I, too, am trying to make amends with the one man I loved the most. I was told he went straight to Santiago. You will know soon. Not soon enough. It's still four weeks till I get there. He'll be there, I'm sure of it. I hope so. I just feel... I just feel that with every day that passes, I'm losing him a bit more. And that the only thing I can allow myself still to hope for is not love, but forgiveness. I understand. Hey, hush now. Not long now and our journey will be over, hmm? The woman's name was Alba. She came from a small town somewhere in Catalonia. I quickly got used to her constantly feeling out for her stepmother's ring and the sad guilt that would always follow in her milky eyes. I wasn't sure if she appreciated my company, but I couldn't leave her on her own either. By the time we reached Los Arcos, she'd stopped talking while I kept on dropping a kind word here and there to let her know I was still by her side. Alba believed herself to be of weak mind and body, and yet she walked the Camino with a strong sense of purpose that willed her onward. 
It made me wonder about what I'd told her about my own journey. Did I hope for love? Or was I really traveling because I needed him to forgive me? But what was there to forgive? My decision to marry Alfred had been in the best interest of the people of Shiring. It was a sacrifice I had to make to stop the evil reign of William Hamley. These questions had haunted me for a long time now. But if I really was going to see Jack soon, it was time to make up my mind. Around Leon, the path began to gradually turn uphill. It was only two more weeks till we'd reached Santiago. The baby was in a good mood, and so, surprisingly, was Alba. After Astorga, the trail got more difficult. Alba became slower and slower, and we had to rest more. She became quiet again. The strain on her old body grew, and she worried that she might not be able to reach the end. Still, we managed to push onward. The next morning, she refused to get up. Her breathing was disturbingly shallow, and she hardly noticed me touching her forehead. Everything hurts, she said, and urged me to continue without her. I was about to leave when a monk stopped me. He urged me to stay at least for another day, and feeling that he was right, I remained. I'd hardly known her, and most of the time she'd tried to push me away, as if she considered herself a nuisance that slowed me down and who didn't deserve company. It wasn't until a few moments before she died that, for the first time, she smiled at me, and I like to believe that she saw me smile back. I still like to believe that here, in this unlikely place, dying next to a near stranger, she'd found a moment of serenity and happiness, but she'd not reached Santiago. When I left, that thought still haunted me, to see that a journey could come to an end so suddenly. But what would be different if she had reached Santiago? Could she have been disappointed by what she found? After months of hard travel, the child and I finally reached Santiago de Compostela. In the evening, we attended mass in the great cathedral, then started to roam the town looking for my dear Jack. It was almost dawn when finally a priest pointed me to an inn close by. 